Welcome to Club Book with Curtis Chin. I'm Chef Katie Chin, moderating tonight. For those of you that are from Minnesota, my mother was the late, great Leanne Chin, so I'm so thrilled to be here tonight with Curtis as we have so much shared in common. Before I introduce tonight's guest properly, allow me a moment to tell you a bit more about the unique series that's bringing him to us. Club Book is a program of MELSA, the Metropolitan Library Service Agency, made possible through Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and coordinated by Library Strategies, part of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. Ramsey County Library is the co-organizer of this evening's talk. Thanks also to partnering bookseller Red Balloon Bookshop. A purchase link to everything I learned, I learned in a Chinese restaurant, will be available in the comments section of this live stream feed. Have it ship, pick it up at their lovely store in St. Paul or have them deliver it personally to your door if you're close to the area. One final housekeeping note, also in the comments, you'll see a survey link. Melsa would greatly appreciate it to hear what you think of this club book program. It's so quick and easy. Now, for our featured event, Curtis Chin is an award-winning filmmaker and activist. He also holds distinction as the co-founder and first executive director behind New York's prestigious Asian American Writers Workshop. His anticipated debut memoir, Everything I Learned, I Learned in a Chinese Restaurant, hit shelves earlier this month. Chin's family restaurant, Chung's Cantonese Cuisine, occupied a special niche in 1980s Detroit. During this tumultuous period, Chung's clientele reflected the growing diversity of the Motor City, all seeking a safe oasis and the simple pleasure of sitting down to a home-cooked meal. Chung's also looms large in Chin's own coming-of-age narrative. In a rave review, novelist Jamie Ford summarizes, coming out and coming in of age are hard enough for the average teen. But when they're in a Chinese-American family, in a city in conflict with itself, it becomes an epic journey of self-discovery. After a short talk with Curtis and some initial questions from me, we'll have time for audience Q&A. Simply drop your questions in the comments thread here on Facebook and our tech manager will route them to me. You can also send a message to Club Book through Facebook Messenger or email. Where we're at clubbookmn at gmail.com. So without further ado, please welcome Curtis Chin. Thank you. Thank you for that warm introduction. And uh, thank you to David and Mary Jo and the rest of Club Book. Very, very excited to be here. Um, it's been an exciting week uh, for me as a debut author. Um, and I'm happy to include Minnesota uh, as part of this big tour I'm doing around the country. Do, should That's I? Great. Do Yes, yes, we want you to talk about your book, and uh, if you want to do a reading, that would be awesome, too. Great. Um, as Katie mentioned, uh, I grew up in Detroit in the 80s. It was a very difficult time period. Not only did you have the auto industry, which was struggling, but you had crack cocaine, you had AIDS. Um, I personally knew five people murdered by the time I was 18 years old, but despite that, it was a great childhood. I mean, because we had this Chinese restaurant and I'm sure Katie can relate hopefully to fond memories of growing up in a kitchen and a dining room and the craziness that can ensue. And in that surrounding, uh, my parents were able to raise six kids and give us all wonderful, wonderful lives. And this book is sort of a thank you to them and all the struggles and all the sacrifices they made uh, for, for us kids. Um, and so I'm going to read uh, just a little bit from the prologue, and then I'll jump in and read a little bit longer story um, towards the back. And so uh, as the book uh, mentions, it, it's called Everything I Learned, I Learned in a Chinese Restaurant. And it's, uh, you know, broken down into three sections of eight stories each. For people that know Chinese superstition, 888 is a good luck number. And so that's why I sort of structured it that way. Um, and I'm just going to start uh, reading a little bit from the prologue. Everything I learned, I learned in a Chinese restaurant. Welcome to Chung's, is this for here to go? Armed with a smile and a red waiter's jacket with a perpetual plum sauce stain, that's how my dad greeted any new face who entered the lobby of our popular Chinese restaurant in Detroit. Interestingly, my great-great-grandpa Gong Li had faced the same question in the late 1800s as he stood cold and alone on a rickety dock in Guangzhou, China, 
trying to decide his future and that of his young impoverished family, for here to go. For here to go, as I got older, it was a question I asked myself, starting in our restaurant's long and open back kitchen, where my family made some of our most popular items, including the tangiest barbecue pork and best smelling almond cookies, my mom taught me my first lessons. Before diving into math, English, and geography, she began with a little American history, tales of elders and ancestors, our family as prologue. And so the prologue just continues talking a little bit about how my family ended up in, in the Midwest, uh, in Michigan, uh, you know, because oftentimes when you hear about the Asian American experience, it's really centered in California or New York or Hawaii. But, you know, I really want to establish that, you know, hey, we've been in the Midwest, for, you know, for a long time, too. And in the case of my family, it started with Gong Li Chin, who um, arrived in the late 1800s, coming from Canton, China, all the way to Canton, Ohio, uh, before realizing there actually weren't any Chinese people there, and then moving up to Detroit. And stretching into, uh, you know, I followed the family history all the way up until the 60s, uh, when in 67, Detroit had this thing called the Detroit uh, riots or rebellion, where um, the city literally was on fire um, um, due to racial tensions. And uh, for the first time ever, my family had to close the restaurant for five days. I mean, they'd opened since 1940, but this is the first time they actually had to shut their doors. Uh, and during that closure of five days, my parents managed to... Uh, have sex. And nine months later, I was born as their riot baby. And so that's sort of my journey. Um, and why maybe I talk about race so much is because without that incident, I probably wouldn't be here. And so that combined with this whole idea, of like, you know, for here to go is really the struggle that I, I went through. I'm trying to figure out, um, do I stay uh, with my family in the inner city of Detroit? Or do I try to go off and find my own pastures? And so the story that I would love to read to you all actually happens in the third section when I'm away in college. Um, but just to help so set up the story itself, uh, this was the 80s. And as a gay man, um, I, sorry, uh, as a gay man, it was, uh, you know, very difficult, um, you know, thinking that I would have a life beyond the age of 30. And so I didn't understand the idea of going to college um, and spending four years uh, you know, in a classroom when I didn't know much how much longer I would have to live. And so um, I ultimately decided to apply because my grand, my mom, you know, who had never had the opportunity to go to college, uh, you know, suggested that, um, you know, she really, really wanted me to go. And so that's end up why I decided to apply. Uh, and then um, I decided to go to Michigan. It was the one school I applied to and I ultimately got in. And uh, I didn't know what I was gonna study there. But um, I discovered the English program, the creative writing program, probably because um, I figured it was an easy day just writing poems. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize how difficult it would be, but uh, I did well and I got into the creative writing program. And so that's the story that I'm going to read. Um, and it's, uh, well, one thing is that the uh, chapters are actually uh, listed off like a Chinese menu. And so um, they'll have numbers and stuff like that. So this one is a uh, M7. So I'm uh, short section about, you know, um, you know, my senior year. Being a creative writing major made me the literary expert at Chung's. That was inevitable as my dad asked every customer, have you met our number three? He's the writer in the family. Every time he mentioned my program, the number of students accepted got smaller and smaller. At some point, I expected him to say I was the only one on campus even allowed to own a pen. One week, one of our writers was out sick. My younger siblings were busy with their weekend activities, so I was the one called in to help. I jumped at the chance to have some home-cooked meals for a few days. I was running around the dining room, refreshing our customers' silver teapots when a white middle-aged woman reached into her oversized bag and pulled out a colorful hardcover. Have you read this book? It's so good. The Joy Luck Club, the recently released novel that featured a bunch of old sassy Chinese ladies who like to eat, gossip, and play mahjong, could have easily been set in our back kitchen. Every time I came in to help at the restaurant, another diner, usually older and female, cited the most memorable characters, lines, and scenes. They all wanted to know if I was working on something similar. I was writing poetry, but they didn't care. To them, all writers were the same. They would squeal, you could be the next Amy Tan. My mom turned out to be the biggest pusher. She rarely had a book in her hand, but the success of the Joy Luck Club convinced her that her life was a bestseller too. She followed me around the dining room, dropping stories from her childhood, the same ones I'd heard growing up, 
but now she recounted them as if she was auditioning for her own books on tape. One night, after seeing how our waiters sometimes pool tips together, my mom shared an oldie. When the communists marched south, they targeted my family. My uncles and grandpa were rich in America, so the Red Guard called us traitors. My stubborn grandma didn't want to leave her big home, so when my parents escaped to Hong Kong, they left me behind to keep her company. The communists hated my pawpaw. When I was four, they made me watch as they forced my grandma to climb the old onion tree in our courtyard. Then they pushed her off into a pile of broken glass. For a visual, my mom rubbed her knees. Another time, standing at the water station, she launched into her own nautical tale. When I was five, my uncle in America paid $25,000 in renminbi, a king's ransom in people's money, to a local fisherman to ferry our remaining family out of China. After a long ride tucked under the planks of his fishy fishing boat, we came up for air. But we weren't in Hong Kong. The trader had turned us into the authorities. In jail, I had to sing communist party songs to earn extra rice for me and my grandma. Another chapter came as we stood beneath a painting of the Chinese countryside. When my papa and I were free from jail, we found that the officials had given away our home to peasants. We were forced to live several villages away in a dirt hut with three other families. Whenever we went out for a pail of water, my grandma had to bend low to keep her head below the soldiers. Once again, she gave me a demonstration, this time bowing her head. Granted, my mom's epic saga interested me. Who wouldn't be intrigued by tales of prison cells, guns, and stolen ransoms? Even the parts about her mundane life in Hong Kong after she was reunited with her parents and siblings were amusing. But these were her stories, not mine. She had to tell them, not me. I was in school to find my own voice. I sat and listened, but that was as far as it would go. Toward the end of the summer, as I was, back, as I was at the back table sipping my red pop, stockpiling poems for the upcoming semester, my mom sat down. Before I could say anything, she started talking. I was a top student at Hong Kong. When Pepsi came to town, they held a big contest for students to draw a picture of their own school. Mine was the best at Sacred Heart. I won six cases. There were so many bottles, I had to give some to the nuns. I threw down my Parker pen, the one I treated myself to after getting into the program. Yes, and they kept burping all day. It was so funny. You've told me the story over and over, and I don't even like Pepsi. I prefer Coke. My mom's shoulders shriveled. The shine faded from her rosy cheeks. You don't want to hear my story? I tensed up. I do, but I'm behind on my own stuff. Between working at Drake's, the journal, and saving the world, my schedule was packed. On top of that, my workshops in the fall were advanced. In still insecure about my place in the program, I put pressure on myself to create more interesting writing by staying up late and scribbling in my notebook every detail of my life. But no matter how hard I tried, working harder could not produce a better poem. My mom lifted herself off her <clears throat> sorry. My mom lifted herself off her seat. The glint in her eyes orphaned me. For 42 years of life flashed before my eyes. She'd gone from Guangzhou to Hong Kong to Detroit and spent the past two decades raising her six children in a hostile foreign land. She tried to prove her life had worth, that it hadn't gone unnoticed. And here I was, the ungrateful son, writing it off. Her lips quivered in a soft murmur. I hastily picked up my pen, backtracking. Go ahead, I'll write it. I'll write it down this time. My mom bowed her head as if I were one of the soldiers holding a gun to her temple, ordering her to sing. No, you go on. You do your own thing. I reached out my hand, but by then she had disappeared through the black swinging door, leaving only the rattling from the kitchen, the clanging walks and rumbling dishwasher. I sat there upset at myself for being so inconsiderate. Everything I had done in the past three years had been for her, but it seemed as though I had failed the final test. My education wasn't just to help me get a better life. It was for my whole family. We were a team. We were the eight immortals. How could I let them down? I needed to make things right, but I knew that, like most disappointments in our house, apologies were never spoken. Only deeds would bring about reconciliation. Yep, that's uh, an excerpt from the book. Thank you. That was so beautiful. And I'm here to say, I read it. It is heartwarming. It's riveting. It's vivid. I could relate to so many of the themes in this book. And I think it's quite universal and transcends uh, race, sex, whatever you want to call it. It's a, just such a relatable story on so many levels. So thank you so much for sharing this book with the world. First, tell everybody uh, where they can get it. I know obviously through uh, Club Book, 
and this amazing bookstore, but it's also available on Amazon and other fine booksellers. Is that right? Yeah, Barnes and Noble. I mean, independent bookstores. Uh, it's pretty wide distribution. Um, you know, the publisher is uh, Little Brown. So Fantastic. they definitely did a job of getting it out there. Mm -hmm. Great. So I think we all want to know what inspired you to write this memoir, Curtis? Wow. Uh, so I've actually been working on some memoir uh, for 10 years. Uh, the one thing that has uh, stayed consistent is the title. Um, so what started me down this road was, uh, you know, sadly, my parents had been in a car accident and my dad passed away. And with that, we had to close down the restaurant. And after that, my siblings and I, we all moved out of Detroit. And I knew my family had this really long, rich history there uh, that we were no longer part of. And when my siblings started having kids, I felt really sad that they that these that this next generation would not know about our history in Michigan. And so uh, I first just started writing family stories, right? Like funny things about my mean grandmother or my grandfather who was <laughs> part of the Chinese mafia. You know, I thought that, oh, okay. But, you know, um, that was the book I intended to write. But then sadly, uh, you know, when George Floyd was murdered and there was a rise in the reporting of anti-Asian hate crimes, I felt like our country was going through a moment of having these discussions about race, racial identity. Um, and I felt like maybe I could contribute to that uh, having grown up in Detroit and having been um, someone who's had to confront these issues. And maybe I could sort of set some light on it in terms of being an Asian American. And so I shifted it, the book, um, to talk more about my identity. Uh, and with that, that's when the book really took off. And um, I just had a lot of interest in the book after that. So mm, it's so important. What was the hardest part about writing this memoir? And how did you choose uh, what to keep in and what to take out? <laughs> well, like I said, I mean, uh, there's eight stories of three sections each. It's 24 stories. Um, and initially, it really was just going to be about my middle school years, really fun, awkward, geeky, whatever. Uh, but um, when I decided to start confronting some of these deeper issues, I had to age up the stories to also include high school and college. And, you know, you're an older person. And so the audience or the readers are probably expecting you to be a little bit more introspective and to probably um, show some more growth. Right. And so that made the book much more difficult to write than I, I initially set out. Right. Because anybody can write cute, funny kid stories, right? You know, uh, they don't expect a little kid to have deep thoughts or whatever. But I think by the time you get to high school and college, they're expecting a bit more. And so it did force me to, um, to confront things that I probably had thought that I'd moved on in, in life, because I feel like maybe that is part of my personality, having grown up in the inner city and having seen so much uh, death and destruction that I felt like maybe my personality was always just to move forward, right? In life. Mm -hmm. But when you write a memoir, you're forced to stop and reflect. Um, and so I don't know if that's stuff I need to do for my daily life, you know, but when writing a memoir, they're definitely, um, those are things that you need to do. So I, I, it was, it was uncommon for me to do that, um, to be so introspective. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of um, the stories, so there's 24 stories that made it into this um, book. But uh, there's another 20 stories that didn't make it in. And I jokingly said to my agent, if this book does really well, I can just sell a second book called Leftovers. And so that will be <laughs> How apropos for a Chinese American family. And I can relate to so much of what you're saying because my mother always, um, her philosophy was to move forward, don't look back, don't dwell on the past, you know, just be productive, just keep moving, keep moving forward. So exactly. I've struggled with that a little bit in my own writing because I think I, you know, blocked out some things, but I feel like it's a responsibility to the next generation. You talk about this in the book a little bit about um, you choosing a non-traditional path, not becoming a lawyer or a doctor or a professor or an engineer that um, many API parents uh, expect of their children. I know that your parents eventually came around and supported your choice, but um, that must have been difficult. And I want to know from you, what advice would you give to a young AAPI person that's choosing a non-traditional path, but their parents really want them to become a doctor? 
Well, I think I eventually got lucky because I think with my parents having six kids, I think they figured they could lose one. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, after that happened, um, you know, one of the things that people ask me is like, given the title of your book, Everything You Learned, You Learned in a Chinese Restaurant, what's the one thing that you learned um, most or what was the most important thing? And I always say that, uh, you know, a lot of parents tell their kids not to talk to strangers. Uh, my parents gave me the exact opposite advice. They said, talk to strangers. And who they were talking about were the people in our dining room, because my mom didn't have the chance to graduate high school. My dad only went to community college for two semesters. They didn't know what opportunities existed outside those four walls for us, but they wanted us to know that they were available to us. And so um, anytime my dad met a customer who he thought had a cool job or was happy with their lives, he would call all six of us kids to run over and barrage these people with questions about like, well, how do you get your job? What do you do for a living? How much money do you make? You know, And um, because of that, the world in some ways opened up to us because we had doctors, we had news reporters, we had a, you know, factory assembly line people. We just had a whole, it was, it was almost like a guidance counselor office, our dining room. And so, um, you know, so my parents were really good about that. Uh, I think while my dad would have wanted one of us to take over the family restaurant because it had been founded by my great grandfather, um, I think he was also um, open to the idea that maybe it wasn't right for any of us. Um, and that we would eventually leave the family business. Um, uh, and so, but that's one good thing about my my parents. I think that they never wanted to limit us. They always wanted us to believe that we could do whatever we wanted. They really pushed us to seize those opportunities. Mm -hmm. You know, they just want us to be happy and uh, make sure that we can pay our mortgage in, in the end, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And once they they realized that we were going to be okay, then they don't, they don't micromanage as much, I think. When I became an executive at Disney, I was, you know, so uh, excited to tell my parents. And uh, I knew they worried about me because I didn't become a doctor or a lawyer like my siblings. But I remember mm -hmm. my dad talking to his friend and he goes, oh, Katie, she's fine. She works at Disneyland. And I was like, I don't work at Disneyland. <laughs> But it was fine. You know, they stopped well, worrying about me. You worked in the stand that sold the dull pineapple stuff. That was exactly. <laughs> yeah, a nice place to work. Um, but in terms of your question about like, what advice would I give to young people? The one advice that I like to give is that if you want to enter these creative fields, you're going to hear the word no a lot. Don't let that voice be your own. Like always give yourself a yes. Always say yes that you can do this, that you believe in yourself, you believe in your story. That doesn't mean you shouldn't take advice from people or that, that when you do hear a no from somebody else that you shouldn't try to alter and change, but just keep saying yes to yourself. Give yourself you know, that room and space to, to do what you need to do, so. I love that, that is awesome advice. I wanna know how you were able to balance being on, honest and authentic with, protecting the privacy of some of the people in your book, namely your family? Um, yeah, it's a hard thing. I mean, I'll be honest with you. It's like, uh, you do have to edit, right? And filter. Um, I felt like I chose uh, particular stories that were emblematic or like that, 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 but I didn't necessarily put all the, the worst things that happened in my life. I mean, because I'm not writing that type of, you know, uh, memoir where i trying to get back at anybody, right? Uh, I have no scores to settle. Um, I just tried to write uh, as honestly as I could about the people around me and how those things impacted me. Um, and at the end of the day, I realized that, um, you know, I just have to, to go with it. Uh, I think what made it a little bit easier is that these stories happened 30 years ago. I'm a different person. I've changed. So like, I can even say, you know, things about myself. I wasn't a per perfect person. I mean, I was a young Republican back then. I was, you know, like class president. You know, I started the Students Against Smoking, you know, uh, Young Republican Club. I was kind of a terror back then. And, um, you know, I could laugh at that now and say I was a different person. Um, but in terms of the idea of writing about your family, um, I, I like to share this story was that I've been doing a lot of readings in advance of the book coming out because I was trying to generate interest in it early. Um, because I'm not a celebrity and so much about memoirs are about celebrities, right? So I felt like I needed to get out early. So I, I did this reading in Texas, Austin, Texas uh, in March and the organizers got to the restaurant early and they said, oh, can you come meet us? And so um, I went 
uh, I said, sure. I called the Uber, I, Uber. I went downstairs to wait for the car to come. And there's this old Chinese lady just standing on the street corner. And she turns around and she sees my sweatshirt that says Detroit versus everybody. And so she asked me, oh, are you from Detroit? And I say, yeah. And she's like, oh, oh my God, uh, I'm from Detroit. And it turns out that her mom was best friends with my grandmother. And if you've read the book, you know that my grandmother is kind of a mean, unfriendly person to me. Do you know what I mean? And very unkind. Uh, and so this woman is there standing on the street corner saying, oh my God, your grandmother was so nice. She always had candy in her pocket. You know, she taught me how to drink American coffee. She's just going on and on about how great my grandmother was. And I just finally said, look, I'm glad that you have these wonderful memories of my grandmother and, and that you like her, but I don't have the same experience. That's just not how I saw her, you know? And I wouldn't try to change this woman's opinion because it would be very sad if my grandmother went through life without anybody loving her, you know? But I just know that that's not the experience I had. And so, you know, I quickly just said goodbye, got in the car and then left. But then a couple of days later, I realized that, you know what? That was probably my grandmother sending an emissary from the grave telling me that, you know, I've maligned her. And, you know, um, so my theory is that when it comes to family, you know, just write what you know, because even if they're dead and buried, they're still going to come out of the grave and tell you <laughs> you're wrong. So you know, there's no easy answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> That's so true. Well, on that subject, have your siblings read the book and have they shared their thoughts with you? Um, no, they haven't. Um, you know, I think that that it's mixed in terms of how they'll respond to it and have respond to it, just even just from some of the media I've been giving. Um, but I think that that it is something that you have to talk to them about because it isn't easy because this isn't something that they signed up for, right? They didn't ask to um, you know have their lives in some ways shared with the world. Um, and so I'm trying to be more sensitive about that because you know as a writer, I just sort of put things out there and I'm just following my own truth. So I'm trying to become at least a little bit more sensitive without necessarily censoring myself about these things um, in terms of how I talk about the book and, and who they are in the book, um, because ultimately it is what it is. It's published now. It's out there, you know, um, so I hope that uh, I, I hope that they can learn to laugh at, at things, you know. That's all I can say. Yeah, I hope that they I hope that they can see that this book was written with love and good humor and that, um, you know, even when I describe things like sibling rivalry and stuff like that, that that's just that's just the way it was. Right. And that's that was 30 years ago. So. Right. And it's, you know, your your perspective on your mm -hmm. childhood, not necessarily theirs. Mm -hmm. What was the most difficult part about writing this memoir and what was the most rewarding part? Uh, well, the most rewarding, rewarding part is easy. I mean, it's thinking about all the food. Oh, my God. Uh, just thinking about the food even now. Like, because, oh, yeah. Food. Well, I was so salivating while I was reading it. Yeah, it was that's the best part. very tempting. Reliving those moments and picturing those dishes and eating them. Um, the most difficult part, obviously, was probably my parents' relationship because they did have a, they did have an arranged marriage and it wasn't the easiest you know, and so I think that was probably the most difficult, and even when recording the audiobook, I did break down in tears um, over certain passages, you know, just remembering certain things. Would you say this memoir has changed your life, and how so? Uh, no, I don't know if it's changed my life. I mean, um, you know, the book just came out a week ago. I mean, it is interesting because I'm getting all this media attention. Uh, you know, not only has this book made the best list for Washington Post, LA Times, San Francisco Chronicle, Goodreads, but um, I just filmed a segment for CBS Saturday Morning News that's going to air next week. Time Magazine is excerpting it. I was on All Things Considered. I'm getting interview requests from as far away as London and China. I mean, so, um, I, I mean, you know, it may change my life, but this could also be very temporary, right? Like this mm -hmm. could just be this debut week or debut month. And then my life will go back to what it was before, which I have no complaints about. And I've had a pretty good life. I've, you know, um, you know, I've had really wonderful opportunities in life. So I, I, there's nothing to complain about. So that's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, you can stop me, but can we talk a little bit about the game show? Okay. <laughs> can you tell us what really happened or do you want to just skip this question? It's so funny because I was on the Wheel of Fortune as a kid and it's a very small part, right? 
of the book. It's like one, one or two chapters. I mean, uh, paragraphs. And a lot of people ask about it. It's so weird, you know. I and it was a longer story, but it just didn't fit in. But anyway, so um, I'll give the long, a little bit longer version. Was that you know, uh, the Wheel of Fortune was traveling around the country looking for people to audition. My older brother, um, you know, was over eighteen at the time, so he went down. And my mom and I accompanied him just to give him support. But I was underage. I was only 17. I was a senior in high school at that time. But when we got there, they said, oh, we're actually looking for people for Teen Week too. So do you want an audition? And so I said, yeah, sure. And I love word puzzles. I love word games. I always did that at the back of the restaurant. I was always like doing the you know jumbo or the scrabble and all those kind of things. And so I took the test. They basically had 15 questions like puzzles and you had to solve them. And I know I got 14 of them right. And I only missed one, which was the love boat. Um, I guess <laughs> the love boat. I, I missed that one. But then, you know, do these practice scenario and, uh, you know, I got I got casted. And so I flew out there and, um, you know, it's really nerve wracking because they don't pay for you to go out there. You have to pay for it yourself. And so I was really nervous about like my family having to spend money for airline ticket because we didn't have a lot of money. And I was thinking, oh, my God, I'm, I'm making my parents pay for an airline ticket out to California. And we didn't have, you know, much. Uh, I couldn't make a vacation. We really was just going out there and we flew to be on the show and then flew right back. But um, I did pretty well. I mean, I won. I won. Um, I won all the puzzles. Uh, except for the last one, the the bonus round. And um, I partly blame my mom for it because, um, you know, when people uh, play Wheel of Fortune, you're always supposed to take the E, right, as the vowel. And um, I chose A because my mom always said, go for the A, go for the A, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know the e, e is bad, you know. And so uh, I chose the A. But the one thing I will say about it is that I'm such a geek is that back in the old days with Wheel of Fortune, you actually had to spend the money, right? You had to buy prizes. They didn't give you cash. And so, you know, the thing that I bought and I was most excited about was the encyclopedia. <laughs> I was so excited. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so that's how geeky I was as a kid. So. Oh my God. I love that story. <laughs> so we have a question coming in uh, from a viewer. Was it the author's idea to follow a chapter structure based on Chinese restaurant menu, or was it your publishers? If yours, did you have to talk them around this creative idea? Uh, no, it was my idea to do the Chinese menu thing because I thought it'd be fun and they seem to be really good about it. I, I have a really wonderful editor um, who was really so supportive. She did multiple rounds of the book with me, um, but a lot of it is that um, I had sold the book on that basic premise of eight uh, stories in three chapters. I think um, the, by the time I sold the book, the most of the work was um, dropping a couple of the stories and then shifting um, a couple of stories that I had written as flashbacks, but instead keeping them in the natural time frame, like cleaning it up a little bit, making it a simpler story. Uh, but no, the structure, the title, they've always loved it. They've always been supportive of that. So that's great. I, I had a really wonderful time working with Little Brown. They were, I just can't say enough about them, um, you know, as a publisher. I, I really won the lottery with them. So that's awesome. Not always the case. Part two of the question, I think you answered it. Thinking more broadly, what was your experience working with a major publisher? So. Uh, you know, it's a it's a challenge. I mean, I'm I'm assuming that this person who asked the question also um, is a writer and is hoping to publish as well. Um, you know, it's there's pros and cons to whatever way you want to do it. Obviously, with the big five, there's a lot of prestige. It opens up a lot of doors for you, but it also takes longer, right, to get the book out there, right? There's so many more people involved from the lawyers to the copy editors to, you know, these different parts. So if you are a person that really wants to get your book out fast, right, then you know maybe self-publishing or independent presses or academic presses might be better for you. But if you're willing to wait, because um, it'll be like almost two years, I think, you know, from when I sold the book. Uh, if you're willing to wait, then you know maybe going for a traditional publisher might be the route for you. Um, you really have to ask that for yourself. Uh, but again, and I think the other thing too is that it really depends on the individuals within those companies and how much they get your story, right? Like if, if they really uh, understand fund fundamentally what you're doing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, 
but publishing is is hard either way, no matter which which way you do it, right? There's so many books being published, um, and then you're also competing with other things like streaming and other forms of entertainment. And how do you, uh, if especially if you're writing a memoir and you're not a celebrity, because one of the things I have discovered about this space um, of writing a memoir is that it's so celebrity driven, right? All the books you know that make the best list, all the books that get featured when you walk into a bookstore. They're all the they're all the famous people, right? And um, you just sort of have to accept that that's part of it. As someone said to me, it's like it's these celebrity memoirs that sell that allow booksellers to to then uh, recommend books like mine. You know, so um, right. there are all these things that you have to think about. Sure. What other advice would you give to an aspiring memoir writer? Like, how how was would one begin the process? Um, well. Okay, so I think that that um, what I would say is that we all think that we've had interesting lives, which is hopefully true. We all think that we can put together two sentences, which is also hopefully true. What I wasn't thinking about at first and why I did have difficulty selling it at first, right, uh, was I wasn't thinking of this fundamental um, question, which is why is this story important to tell now and why am I that person to tell that story? So when I first was starting to write this story, it's just like a happy family comedy that I mentioned to you all. Um, I approached 90 agents and 30 of them never wrote back to me. 30 of them wrote back to me as thanks, but no thanks. And then about 30 of them said, okay, send me some pages. From that, maybe about a third of them send, said, send the full manuscript. And then maybe half of those said, you know, revise and submit. I mean, so, and then ultimately at the end of the day, they all rejected it. And then I took a step back and said, well, what am I, why is this book not connecting? People are saying that they love the writing, they love the world, but they just don't think that they could sell this book. And that's when, again, I shifted the age of the years that I was covering to be more introspective, to, to talk about some of the issues that our country was going through. And after that happened, I had multiple offers from agents. The book sold um, in three weeks in a giant bidding war between all the big publishers um, and it sold for a pretty good number, um, you know? And so uh, that was the thing that I was missing. I, I didn't, I just assumed that, oh, I had an interesting life. You know, people are gonna wanna love reading about me, you know, <laughs> but that's not, not, that's not necessarily always the case, right? You, <laughs> you know, there is what the reader wants, right? What are they looking for? And I think that with memoirs, oftentimes people are reading memoirs because they're specifically dealing with something in their life that they're trying to understand or solve or whatever. And that's why they pick up your book to see how it helps them find that answer. And so because of that, you do have to think how your memoir should be helpful to the reader in terms of them and their journey that they're going on. And if you, and if you can find a story or, 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 you know, why your story might help somebody, that might be the difference in terms of, um, you know, um, being able to sell your memoir or not. And again, that's if you want to go through the traditional route. I think that's such great advice. And I think um, being AAPI, we sometimes, you know, we have to be perfect. Um, mm -hmm. We put ourselves out there, put ourselves out on a limb. And if we get rejected, we're like, <laughs> mm. <laughs> climb into a hole. But you have to persevere, right? You mm -hmm. have to put yourself out there and you cannot be afraid of rejection, especially yeah. um, with something so personal. Yeah. And the other thing that I would say about mainstream publishing um, is that um, sometimes, you know, as people of color, we know where our community is and we have experience with it. And sometimes we have to tell them some of these things, um, you know, and I recently read this article uh, about Black British writers and how after um, George Floyd was murdered, a lot of them were able to get good book deals. But because the publishing houses didn't necessarily know how to market them or didn't put them financial support behind them, the books underperformed. And since then, uh, Black British writers have had, had an even more difficult time selling their books. So it was sort of like a backlash where they were being blamed for these sales, um, which I don't think is really fair, right? And so for me, as an Asian American writer, I'm happy to be at a big five, but I also recognize that maybe they don't have a long track record of really doing a deep dive into the Asian American community, of knowing where you know, what are the best organizations to reach out to, the best community leaders, right? It's something that they're learning too, as they're trying to diversify their, uh, you know, list of books that they're doing, right? Um, 
you know, because even as recently, like as like what maybe five years ago, 90 something percent of books were being published were by white authors, right? And mm. so, um, you know, we want those numbers to change, but you also have to do it in a way that supports those writers, right? Instead of just expecting them, expecting that audience to know how to find them, right? Because they haven't, they haven't had that conversation before. So. Absolutely. Um, you co-founded the Asian American Writers Workshop. Can you talk a little bit about it and its mission? And also someone wants to know, did they do anything special to celebrate your book's release? Um, I'm sorry, I got distracted by this uh, email, uh, uh, the, uh, chat, question in the chat, <laughs> about someone saying their brother-in-law uh, stayed. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, who's that? Who could it be? Anyway, uh, what was the question? <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit about the Asian American Writers oh. Workshop? You co-founded it, yeah. uh, what it, uh, its mission is, and also yeah. uh, someone wants to know, did they do anything special to celebrate the release of your book? Oh, the Writers Workshop is, has this wonderful place in my heart. I just love it. I mean, so I had gone to the University of Michigan. I loved Michigan. I loved Ann Arbor. But it was, frankly, difficult being the only writer of color in the creative writing program. There were 20 of us in there. And, you know, you'll have to read the book to find out the specific issues of what I had and the experience I had to go through. But I really knew that upon, you know, leaving, um, you know, uh, you know, spoiler alert, I mean, because you can kind of guess, but, you know, the answer to that question that I first start, uh, answer on, on page one for here to go is that I do decide I have to go, I have to leave Michigan. And so um, one, of, one of the things I wanted to do upon leaving was to find a community of Asian American writers or writers of color um, who could give me uh, a certain type of feedback that I was looking for in terms of the, the stories I was writing. Um, and uh, the workshop really just nurtured me. And so many people have gone through that organization. Uh, I know that uh, I became their first executive director. Um, when I left, you know, we were offering $10,000 scholarships to people. We had the largest Asian American bookstore in the country. We were publishing books that, you know, won the American Book Award. We were touring poets around the country through a thing called the Poetry Caravan. Um, we were doing so much, you know, connecting people to agents and stuff like that. And so, you know, um, it's just a beautiful organization. And, you know, uh, most Asian American writers that you've heard of have had some connection to the organization that passed through its doors. And I think that's the legacy of the organization. And it's great that it's still going strong now. I mean, you know, even though we founded it 30 odd years ago. That's terrific. Mm -hmm. um, Rachel Bear, you were reading this, so I'm just going to read it out loud. Uh, I'm so interested to read this book. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My brother-in-law, who knows you, stayed with us this past weekend and told us about your book. Best wishes for your future. You have to direct message me who, the, who your brother-in-law is. <laughs> um, Rachel, who's your brother-in-law? <laughs> <laughs> direct message it, though. I don't want to embarrass anybody. Um, but so thank you. Thank you to him, um, you know, for saying that. Uh, that's very nice. Uh, I love it. Uh, we yeah. have some questions that were submitted a little bit earlier. Someone wants to know, were there any aspects or episodes from the book that were especially fun or joyful for you to revisit? You know, it's really interesting. Um, when I first sent that email to myself saying that I want to write this memoir, I made a whole list of all the stories that I thought would make it in the book, right? Who I thought were the defining moments of my life. And really only about 10% of those stories actually made it into the book, right? Um, because uh, again, they were more happy-go-lucky stories, like how my grandmother, you know, like uh, boiled our pet turtles for dinner one night, you know what I mean? Or my grandfather who, you know, was part of the Chinese mafia, um, you know? Uh, and so those are fun stories for me or, and even things that I thought like, oh, that's a, that was a real life-defining moment. Like when I got lost in Hudson's department store um, in Santa Claus's, you know, uh, world, whatever. And yet at, this, at the age of, uh, I think I was probably three years old or something, I didn't panic. I didn't cry, right? Like, and I just calmly went up to an elf and just said, you know, I was looking for my parents and they, they were able to connect. And so like there were certain things that I thought were defining moments of my life but they turned out not to be the things that really helped, you know, progress the story or, or, you know, made it into the story. So I think that was the surprising thing to me. Um, in terms of favorite stories, oh, God, there's so many. And they're like certain, you know, ones where it's like, 
I'll remember somebody and then my heart will go a flutter. Like even thinking now, like, you know, like maybe even some of my past crushes, my first crushes, I'm like, oh, oh, uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it, it was a joy um, for the most part. Uh, writing the book. Um, you, like I said, there were some difficult times in terms of reliving the the difficult parts, but overall, it was a joy to write. It was a lot of fun. Someone else wants to know, has there ever been a documentary about Chung's Cantonese, or could there be one in the future? A documentary about it? Um, On the restaurant. Yeah, no, um, I am doing a podcast for a show called America's Test Kitchen right now. Um, you know, they read the book and loved it, said there was one particular dish called almond boneless chicken, which is ubiquitous in Detroit, but rarely found in other places around the country. And so they were curious about this dish. So I'm actually uh, producing an episode for them, and that will come out at the end of November. Um, but I don't know. I do make documentaries for a living, um, but I don't think this is a subject that I would want to do. Um, I think that for this book, I have we're already starting to get interest from some TV and film people. So I would love to do it as a TV series, not as a literal thing, but more as a TV series inspired by the book. Because I want to be able to like be more creative and have more fun with it, um, but yet use this backdrop of Detroit in the 80s. Um, so that's what I would like to do. I don't think that I could do a documentary about it. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't think there's enough material out there for it. Um, you know, and uh, a lot of my older family members are dying and the ones that are still around, the ones in their nineties don't seem to want to talk. So that would, that would not mm -hmm. be thing I could do. Yeah. <clears throat> Here's another question coming in. You're traveling so much right now and surely getting lots of questions. What question most surprised you? Which has been your favorite? What's something you've wanted to have, have asked but hasn't popped up yet? Oh, wow. Yeah, no. So I have been on this tour. So I actually um, did what I call the pre-launch tour starting all the way in February. And I actually started off with uh, uh, the portion called All the Colleges My Mom Wish I Applied To. So I started at, at Harvard Law School, went to MIT, down to Yale, Columbia, Princeton. It was torture. Um, uh, and I even went to five places in Europe already because um, there was a professor in Germany who, who loves talking about Detroit and wanted you know, me to go out there and talk there. And so we did two talks in Germany and three in, in the Netherlands. Um, and so it's been fun already being on the road. I did, I don't know, maybe about, I'm guessing 50, 60 of those in advance. But now, um, you know, even between now and November 20th, I'm only home for three nights. And even those three nights, I have three events in Los Angeles. So I'm going to be going everywhere from Seattle to Miami, you know, and I'm literally in Boston right now. Um, so I am on the road uh, a lot. Um, in terms of are there any questions that have surprised me? Um, no, but I, I will tell you one of the joys of being on the road is people coming up to us because I think I mentioned that, you know, when my um, when my dad, when we closed the restaurant, my dad, um, you know, did it very quickly, right? He, he closed within a couple of days, um, even though I felt like I wanted him to have a big party to thank people. Um, you know, for, for frequenting the business and supporting my family for, for so long. But I think that it was too emotionally hard for him. So he just sort of in some ways closed in the middle of the night, even though we had run this business for 60 years and it was a beloved restaurant. And so we never got a chance to say goodbye to people or thank them. And so doing this tour, so many people have come out of the woodwork and offered, you know, their thoughts and thank yous and, and fond memories of the restaurant. And that's been the best part about it. And I, I like, and even just yesterday, I did a reading in Cambridge at Porter Square Books. And um, this woman got up and she talked about going to my family's restaurant and having so much fun there and the food and just these warm memories. And then she said that her mom, you know, is now suffering dementia and it's been really hard for the family. But when she told her mom that she was going to this reading uh, about Chung's from one of the kids there, her mom's memory of our restaurant was so lucid, including the food and, and the decorations. And it just, it just warmed my heart to hear that, that um, she had this moment with her mom where they could relive that and, and 
I don't know, in some ways be back to the way they were before, before dementia came in. And it just, you know, that's why I love growing up in a restaurant. It's, it's these, the connection that you have with this and how you help people and you make people, you know, you give them something special to remember. And, and I'm glad that our family was able to do that. And so that's the stuff that's really wonderful for me um, of being on the road. Um, it's, it's, I, I don't, you know, questions are questions, um, but it's, it's more when the fans of our restaurant come up to me, that's the things that I remember. That is really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Another per person wants to know if you've stayed in touch with any of the customers or wait staff from the early days, uh, improbable friendships that have endured through time. You know, it's not like um, these days, right? Where everybody's connected to social media, but um, you know, uh, it's been really fun because like I mentioned, people are coming out of the woodwork. So one thing that was really cool so far is that this guy um, contacted me uh, out of the blue and said, oh, I went to high school with your dad. You know, my dad died young. And so I never got a chance to talk to him about these things or ask him stuff. And it's amazing too, to think that all the stuff that my dad could have shared with me when he was alive, but he didn't. So this guy said, oh, he was like good friends with my dad in high school. They even had this uh, secret club that they were part of. And then he shared um, the yearbook uh, of my dad, right? And I'd never seen it. And I looked it up and it's like, wow, my dad did things like student council. He went to Boy State. He did all this stuff that I did, but he never ever brought it up to me when I went through that stuff. It's not like he said, oh, I did that in high school too. Um, I don't know why he never did that. Uh, but now I have this other thought of like, wow, maybe I was more like to my dad than I thought, right? And that's kind of a nice thing. Um, and so I'm very thankful of that too. Um, you know, that, 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 that person has done that. Um, but in terms of me actively staying in contact, I think that it's just been wonderful because so many people are coming out of the woodwork to make those reconnections. But no, I was not in contact with these people for many years, right? Um, I think some of my other siblings were may have been better about that than I, but I left Michigan right after college. I didn't necessarily stay behind versus some of my other siblings who did. Um, and so they probably stayed in contact with some of these um, customers a little bit longer and staff people, but I left at the age of 22. And so, um, you know, I had a long distance, uh, a, a, you know, separation from them, but uh, through writing this book and definitely now as the book's been coming out and people are hearing about it, um, you know, I'm starting to make those connections, which is great. You never know who might come out of the woodwork, right? Um, Another viewer is asking, is it fair to ask if we, your readers, may ever see some of the discarded stories in another memoir, as you said, <laughs> the leftovers? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, maybe, who knows? I mean, you know, uh, you know, as all writers, right, we write down our stories and we keep them in a little folder and we pull them out whenever it's appropriate. Who knows? It could be part of a TV show. It could be part of uh, another memoir. Um, I do have another piece um, that isn't in this book in Bon Appetit that was selected for best American food writing. Um, you know, and that actually just came out last week too on the same day that my book came out. So you can find another story of mine um, in Bon Appetit. Uh, maybe you can just Google my name. Uh, and uh, that's another story if you're interested in more stuff. That's that's amazing. Uh, how do we find you? What's your website, Curtis? And how uh, do we find you on social media? Yeah, it's curtisfromdetroit.com. You can also see my travel schedule on there, um, you know, up through November, I think. Uh, and yeah, uh, hopefully you all have friends in other places. Feel free to like, you know, send them, send them to these things. I, I have to say that my alumni group, the University of Michigan has been wonderful uh, in terms of getting the word out everywhere I go. There's always a few Wolverines. I, I know that you guys are in Minnesota and we did win the brown jug a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but um, you know, hopefully you guys have uh, forgiven us for that. <laughs> you know, um, and I also have to thank, you know, the community, the Asian American community has been really great about supporting me. Um, you know, some of the prominent organizations like Stop AAPI Hate offered to do an event for me, the AAPI Civic Engagement Fund, um, the Asian Pacific American, Asian Pacific Islander American Health Forum. You know, they've all just really come out and supported me, the Asian American Foundation, um, you know, is funding a lot of my travel, like in terms of traveling around, because people often ask, well, is, you know, you're going on a big tour. That's great. 
you know, um, but, you know, you do have to find additional funds to do it because, you know, the publishing companies don't have a lot of mon money for uh, big tours anymore. And so you do have to be creative in terms of finding, you know, um, that support elsewhere. And I'm so thankful that the community has really stepped up and really offered their support and really embraced the book, which is great. Yes. Well, there's really powerful messages in the book. And also, you know, you get what you give. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another uh, great piece of advice because I'm a fellow author of cookbooks. I've written five cookbooks. Um, you know, you really have to work as hard as the publisher in marketing your book, right? Yeah, yeah. Because ultimately, you have to be your number one publicist. No matter how good your publicist is, you know, at the company, you have to want it more than they do, right? I mean, this is your life, right? This is your one book that you should be working on, you know? And so um, that's the way I sort of approached it. Because there are some writers who don't feel like that that's part of their job, right? They say, I wrote right. the book. That's it. I don't know anything about marketing. But, you know, if you if you really love your book, then you're going to do it. That's the way I think. You have to treat it like your baby. Mm -hmm. um, one time when my mother and I, we did a cookbook together and it came out and then there was a Food Network mm -hmm. special and I, I printed up like thousands of postcards and, yeah. and because this is before social media, right? And my mom pulled me aside. She was like, here's the thing. Chinese people don't go around saying, look at me, look at me. And I was so ashamed. But you know, we have to turn the tide because it's our time and we should be loud and proud. One last question. I love book cover art and find yours to have great curb appeal. Did you have any say in the color, color and imagery selections or was this all the publisher's team? Uh, this was actually not the original cover. It went through several. Um, of which I did have a say, and I felt like I wanted something else. <laughs> and so we ended up this one. Yeah. Great. So that's well, that's great. another great piece of advice. Stand your ground, right? Yeah, because this is your book and this represents you. And, you know, so much is, um, sadly, so much of the book's success is based off the title and the cover, right? Most people don't get past it, that you have to, you know, have this curb appeal where someone said, oh, it's an interesting title. Oh, the cover's interesting. Then flipping over to those first couple lines, it's, you know, people uh, make really uh, quick decisions whether or not they're gonna read further, right? Um, and again, if you're competing with all these other stories out there, how do you grab their attention and how do you hold on to it? Um, you know, that's, that's, uh, that is a challenge, right? Um, Cause there um, are- inquire Sorry. Good. Inquiring minds wanna know, what is your all-time favorite Chung's recipe? Oh, well, it's it's going to be, well, I have to say the egg rolls because we sold so many of them, right? I mean, and they're so delicious. And it took my grandmother and my mom like two days to make each one, right? Because she made the skin fresh and even the sauce. But wow. I have to say the almond boneless chicken um, was really great because it's a Detroit thing. But I don't know, the almond, you know, the beef and mushroom was great. I got, there's too many. I, there's no, there's not one. Like even now I'm like, oh, well, I could go for lap chop lo mein. I could go for the word or par. God, there's so many different dishes. You Stop know. torturing us. We're now yeah. starving. <laughs> what was yours? What was your favorite dish? Of my mom's. Oh my God. It's, you know, it's Sophie's choice. Right. But I kind of feel like it, it all depends on my mood. Yeah. Right. I'm feeling yeah. kind of melancholy. I crave her pan fried chicken chow mein. If I'm feeling kind of festive, I'm craving her shrimp toast. So it yeah. just kind of, you know, it just depends on what I'm I'm going through. But they're kind of like old friends, right? That you okay. count on. Yeah. And Chinese food is so way. great because there's so many dishes, right? And so many options and so many ways to special order. I mean, it really can tailor to each individual's taste, right? I mean, because right. the walk and walk cooking is so flexible, right? Um, that it really can be personalized in a way. Um, Absolutely. And it yeah. just invokes different, you know, stages of your childhood and, and adulthood for that matter. Oh my God, I can't believe this hour has flown by. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to say the mystery um, to the question is Rachel Bear's brother-in-law is James Bear. for Oh, Christmas. James yeah. Bear. Oh, Yay. okay. Yay. <laughs> I think I'm supposed to see him tomorrow. He's visiting Hi. from London. <laughs> Amazing. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Curtis, for joining Great. us tonight. We know how busy your schedule is. Um, this has been a virtual presentation of Club Book, a long-running literary series of MELSA made possible by the Arts and Cultural Heritage mm. Fund. 
Special thanks again to Ramsey County Library for the part they played in bringing Curtis to us. Before you log off, look for the club book survey link, which is in the comments and will be projected in place of my video momentarily. Last, consider joining club book on Wednesday, November 1st for their next virtual program featuring chart topping historical fiction novelist, Fiona Davis. Fiona's latest, The Spectacular, the Spectacular tells previously untold stories about New York City's venerable Rady City Music Hall and the iconic Rockettes. You can learn more about that and other upcoming events at clubbook.org. Have a great night, everybody, and thanks for joining. By the way, Curtis and I are not related, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> We're not related. We're kindred spirits, though. But I believe that to be true. Thank you so much, everyone.